ji assalam alaikum and go, good afternoon um and good morning to munib and um, thank you very much for joining all the panelists we have a very rich panel here uh, rich in the sense um of diversity and um, we have munib ali um who is the co-founder and ceo of blockstack and uh, represents industry and um, we also have faisal aftab who is uh, managing a venture capitalist firm uh, lexon ventures and uh, we also have uh, academia represented in the panel uh, basit chapik and uh, navid navidul hasan um, both of them are uh, from the school of science and engineering sayed babareli school of science and engineering at, at lams faculty members in the computer science and electrical engineering departments uh, thank you very much everyone especially munib you know it's uh, i know it's 6 am uh, in new york and <laughs> you, you know uh, I would, I I would need probably 10 cups of coffee to be awake uh, this awake as you are um so thank you very much for for joining and uh, we are uh, we are looking forward to a very interesting session on something which is uh, which has gained a lot of importance uh, you know especially in the last few months it uh, you know with the bitcoin hitting uh, hitting high you know i think it was $26000 yesterday i don't know what it would be today or or tomorrow but um, you know what what are the basics behind uh, the cryptocurrency we we know uh, of blockchain um by reference to the cryptocurrency which is the most um you know well known to the public application um but we will talk about in today's session we'll talk about what actually blockchain is the basics of 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 blockchain what are the other applications other than cryptocurrency um and how it may transform the uh, the internet we might uh, go into a new generation new architecture of uh, of internet and we'll talk about some of the some of the very um you know commonly used terms the mining processes and you know what kind of blockchain how you can create a a blockchain should you use a a, a regular blockchain and we will also try to talk about you know what are the gaps between the industry and academia and what should academia do uh, in terms of offering um, you know some courses as part of their curriculum to to make sure that the gap between the industry and academia in this particular field is is covered and the, and the people who graduate they are they are readily able to to contribute to to this area so once again welcome everyone and i would like to thank the lums office of advancement uh, for managing um, these seminars lums live session um i also thank um uh, ali fahad who is uh, who started this spark launch venture where i met faisal aftab i know i know everyone basit uh, navid and uh, and and munib um for a very long time munib i know for like 20 years now um but faisal i probably know him in for less than 20 days i was introduced to him through uh, through park launch and it was a great pleasure to to meet with him and he was uh, gracious enough to um to accept our invitation to be on the panel um on such a short notice so thank you very much thank you everyone um so to kick start the discussion um i think we would i would like to mention uh, marwa who is the Uh, the co-host here uh, from lums office of advancement also mentioned that we have a diverse um, audience here uh, there is, there is a lot of people so we'll try to to use english and urdu dono istemal karenge um, and we'll also um, try to focus on on the basics uh, rather than you know talking about very advanced things we will try to uh, to capture some of the advanced things as well lekin koshish karenge ke kuch basics ka bhi hame idea ho jaye um so um you know so somebody like me who is who is really um you know um, very early starter in the in the blockchain area um, compared to all the other panelists uh, so it would be i am looking forward to this as a learning experience for myself as well um so i think um, if we can start with the with the blockchain basics you know very um, to a to a layman uh, how would you explain what is what is blockchain um kis tarah se explain karenge so munib if you can kindly uh, you know volunteer to answer that sure uh, happy to so i think the simplest way to probably understand blockchains is that whenever um 
if you're running any 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 internet service, you're always connecting to a company uh, that is running some sort of a server or some sort of a database, right? So there is this implicit, almost like a uh, trust-based relationship. Like let's say you're connecting to Facebook. Uh, you know that, you know, this is Facebook, the company, and I'm connecting to their servers. Same with, you know, if you're doing a search on Google, you know that I'm connecting to the Google servers and I kind of like trust those companies. And blockchains are kind of like this new type of a um, uh, concept where you're not, they're not run by any company, right? So the main, main thing to understand about blockchains is that they are decentralized in the sense that no single party uh, really controls a blockchain, right? So when you're reading information from a blockchain or you're writing information to a blockchain, uh, think of that as a group of people or nodes that are coming together collectively to provide some sort of a service. And the key property is that uh, no single party can work. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Thank you, Muneeb. Um, so I would, I would like to touch upon the, the magnitude, the financial impact that uh, blockchain can have. And as we mentioned in the start of the session, K, Bitcoin, you know, high period at the hair, low period at the 2017 can pay high period at the $20,000 touch. Kia tha, per niche salagia. Abdubara says, previous records have been broken, and now it has, you know, uh, well surpassed that previous record. Um, so Fessel Sab, up say a savaloga, you know, how does the venture capitalist community see it, you know, in terms of uh, kya wo, very, very recently we heard about, um, you know, Square, Jack Dorsey investing uh, from Square into $50 million of Bitcoin purchase and PayPal and transactions Bitcoin. You know, all of that has added up. How is the, how is the venture capitalist community looking at it? How is the layout layout? Sure. So, um, th first of all, thank you for having me on the panel. Um, so in Pakistan, I think I would separate Pakistan versus Silicon Valley and other parts of the world. In Pakistan right now, we're not looking at crypto uh, just because the state bank has uh, not opined on it um, in terms of the status. But at least in the rest of the world, uh, you're seeing not just venture capitalists, but companies. So if you see in the last uh, couple of months, and the reason why I'll actually come back to your first question, the reason why Bitcoin is climbing, it actually... Um, it follows a, something called a stock to flow ratio. And so it, it actually, the rewards, it's, you, you mine Bitcoin using processing power throughout the world. And every four years, the block rewards halve. So the last halving was in 2016. And then four years later, in I believe it was May of 2020, the halving happened. So those of us like Muneeb and myself that have been active in the uh, crypto space understand that these cycles repeat. And obviously past performance doesn't necessarily guarantee it, but as a monetary network, as there's scarcity, you'll see that the price starts to increase. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is what you're seeing is a lot of the investors coming in are looking at Bitcoin as a store of value. And that's been validated most recently by Guggenheim uh, Asset Management, which is one of the largest investors in the world. Uh, they've gone in and put a significant chunk, uh, I believe it was about $500 million into Bitcoin. Uh, you've seen companies move in and use their balance sheet and put it in Bitcoin. The main reason for that is because there's a long-term credit cycle and global macro uh, events that are playing out in line with this exchange of value disruption uh, when it comes to Bitcoin. So it's, it's slightly a long-winded answer to your, to your question on venture capital, but you have to understand that in the current stage, most of the investments that are going in are going in as a preservation of wealth and a store of value, similar to what happened, I would say closer to the 1970s and previously in the 19, uh, between 1914 to 1945, where you have a transition from, let's say the pound to the dollar as a reserve currency. And similarly today, we're seeing the same events play out where China is challenging US on trade, essentially, right? So that means that there may be a new currency coming out and smart money is just simply positioning into a neutral asset as central banks start to print and debase currency. So that's most that's where the chunk of the investment is coming in. And then you're obviously seeing things like money going into exchanges from venture capitals, going into specific blockchains. 
um, that are solving solutions. So for example, XRP is funded, Muneeb, I think Blockstack is also funded by um, two of the major uh, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. And so these are projects that are solving a specific problem. Uh, most of it tends to be today in the settlement uh, component, settlement of uh, payments or, or store of value, but there are obviously other applications as well. I'll, I'll give the floor to someone else, but uh, thought I'd give a, my perspective on uh, blockchain and cryptos. Maybe, maybe a quick follow-up on, on that would be, you know, in terms of, of risk, uh, why would a stable company or, you know, somebody like Square would want to invest their, uh, you know, cash flow into, into, into Bitcoin? Um, you know, why, why not something else? Um, you know, the, the risks are, are higher uh, or at least as perceived by the, by the general public. Um, that, may be, that may be a wrong perception, but Please, uh, please enlighten us on it. Would you like me to answer that? Or, uh, so the, one of the, you know, when you look at a lot of the investment analysts abroad, what, um, the reason why Guggenheim has gone in is essentially it's a scarcity uh, component, right? So if you look at the US, um, I'll, and I'll do the analogy with gold, um, and you can then assess from there, which is a more stable asset. So gold, for example, from all the gold that has been dug up in the history of mankind uh, has a market cap of roughly around nine to $10 trillion uh, in terms of all the assets that are out there, which are counting derivatives and uh, all sorts of assets. You're looking at 300 trillion plus investable assets that are out there, right? So a small component. Um, when you look at the amount of dollars that have been printed, and I'm using the dollars as a base because our current monetary system since 71 has been linked to the United States treasury or US dollar uh, uh, bond. Um, if you look at what, what happened on March 22nd, we literally printed $7 trillion in one day. So of all the gold that was mined, um, in essence, you know, 70% of that was printed in out of thin air in one day. And then again, yesterday we had another, uh, I, I don't, I, I've stopped tracking the number, but it must have been, supposedly it was 900 billion, but it might be 1.4 trillion. I stopped reading the gist of it because it's a pattern. Right? It's just governments are continuing printing to bail themselves out and it's a governance issue. And this is historical. This has happened through history of um, uh, humanity where currencies always lose value. So Bitcoin, I guess you can say that it, um, you can perceive it to be a volatile asset. I would say uh, to the contrary that I think that is showing you the heartbeat of the monetary system where it's actually a patient that's dying. So it's going up and down. The reason why you can't see it in bonds and stocks and other assets is because they've created a futures market that stabilizes those markets. And so Bitcoin being one of those assets, even though it's traded in the futures market, has a smaller market cap. It just moves up and down. As it gets larger and larger, it will stabilize. Uh, some say when it, it, I mean, if you look at it from a currency point of view, it's already the sixth largest currency on the planet, right? And once it gets to a value of 250,000, the mathematic actually works out. Um, at at hundred thousand dollars, Bitcoin's market cap is two trillion dollars. Given the amount of money that's printed, that's not a lot of uh, money, right? And there's a finite supply of twenty-one million uh, Bitcoin. I think about roughly eighteen million have been mined, of which about three to six million have been lost forever. So it's a it's a scarcity component as well. The demand is increasing, and lastly, what I'll say is that as more and more fiat on-ramps come on. So that is the most important component when you're looking at Bitcoin. So paper, it's, it's about ease of use, right? So when I first got into crypto, it was, you literally had to like learn 50 different things on how to actually go and buy Bitcoin because it wasn't, wasn't that easy. Now, eventually then you had Coinbase that came in that would allow you to just press one button, link it to your bank account. With PayPal onboarding it, in essence, that's made you know, you, ease of use and onboarding really easy. The next step is when we see Google or Facebook or one of the other players uh, cre create, you know, onboard crypto. I think that'll change the entire game. So uh, the money will go, uh, the, the, the price will continue to go up. Um, but again, just wanted to explain the lay of the land uh, because it's a, it's a process of how it's being adopted. And the price, by the way, the, the very last thing I will say, what the price is reflecting is basically uh, the adoption. And it's mm. less than 1% of the planet right now. So you can only imagine as more and more people actually realize that the, the currency is being debased, 
um, everyone's going to run for a store of value, whether it's gold or Bitcoin or whatever their uh, choice. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. Um, so we'll come back to the cryptocurrency, which is the you know most prevalent application of, of blockchain, um, and, and and figure out why we can, why or why not we can use cryptocurrency in lieu of of regular currency or the, a digital currency. Can we use it as a digital currency, or should it be treated as as gold, uh, you know, where you you part your assets? Uh, um, but I will. I would like to switch the gears a little bit and uh, and look at the the technology behind um, behind the cryptocurrency, which is blockchain, and look at the other applications of of blockchain. And and will request um, Dr. Basit Shafiq to um, to tell us about um, you know what kind of applications um, you know you have been looking at more recently in the in the blockchain area and uh, how blockchain can be used um, to to create the so-called smart contracts and uh, help various different uh, problems traditional problems solved in a in a uh, you know blockchain way sure sure so um, as uh, munib and uh, Faisal uh, have already said that uh, blockchain um, essentially is a distributed ledger um, which is replicated um, in a network of peers. So there is no uh, central authority or a bank that maintains this ledger. This is maintained uh, by a network of peers and anyone can join that peer network depending on uh, the type of the network uh, it is. Um, so anything um, that... Uh, use of a ledger uh, can essentially be in the blockchain network. Um, I have looked at uh, uh, several domains in which uh, these blockchain-based applications have been employed. Uh, E-government is one. Uh, then you have agricultural and food supply chain sector, disaster man, uh, network services, and so on. Now, in the e-government, um, Again, blockchain help us um, in delivering of government services in a transparent manner or, or um, essentially um, keep a record of those. So uh, one example that I can give is this fertilizer subsidy management uh, project uh, that is initiated in India. Uh, there is a pilot project. Uh, so fertilizer subsidy is the second biggest subsidy program in India amounts to 10 billion US dollar in, uh, in the last academic year. Uh, in India, the fertilizer subsidy is given to the manufacturer after the final sale of the product. Um, and essentially, uh, the, it, it, it's a very complex manual process where lots of paperwork invoices are generated and this is being audited and there are multiple parties that are involved who may have conflicting interest mm -hmm. uh, in those. Um, so what they have done or, or what they want to do, they have a pilot of that is every time a transaction in this supply chain um, occurs, that is recorded on the blockchain. So once you have that uh, complete record of all the transactions in this supply chain, um, Essentially, that eases uh, the work of uh, government um, as well as uh, the manufacturers to settle their claims. So this is being used in India for settlement of claims in a uh, transparent manner. Similarly, in the agricultural uh, uh, and food supply chain sector, blockchain has been increasingly uh, used, um, especially in the agriculture sector, when you have index-based insurance, um, index-based insurance are uh, uh, insurance products uh, for agricultural uh, produce or crops where a settlement is made based on some weather index. For example, a farmer may buy uh, insurance on uh, his or her crop uh, depending on the average weather condition in that particular locality. For example, a farmer may say, uh, may buy insurance 
the term would be if the rain average rainfall in that particular season is uh, 70% more or 70% less than the average rainfall in the last 10 years, then the insurance payout will be given to that farmer. And as we know, there are several weather related services that are involved. So um, an automated payment furnishing system can be established or an escrow system can be established where the insurer can uh, deposit the money to an escrow system. And when these uh, conditions are met, either the payout is made to the insured or the premium is charged uh, by the insurance company. Similarly, um, uh, another important sector where blockchain has been used um, is, is for cash assistance or food assistance by UN or the World Food Program. Uh, one of the first such program or project was initiated in Pakistan and Sindh by World uh, Food Program. Um, and uh, there the idea was to authenticate the beneficiaries who, who are actually vulnerable or, or, or poor people, um, and then keep track of the assistance given to them, which was subsequently um, extended uh, by uh, WFP or, or World Food Program in Syria and other uh, countries uh, for humanitarian and crisis management, specifically for uh, dispensing uh, food assistance and cash assistance. Um, and again, uh, another application, I think Muneeb would be able to um, elaborate more on, on these network services for DNS services and so on. Uh, one of the work that we are doing is, uh, uh, in, in our uh, research work, what we are doing is um, in the context of access control and security in distributed applications. So the idea over here is um, you have distributed applications, business processes, or workflows, and in these distributed applications, you may want to use resources from different uh, organizations, um, and they have their own uh, access control policies. Um, so uh, blockchain uh, can provide a way to ensure that the user who is requesting for these resources satisfy their uh, access control policies or not. So I'll end here, and, and uh, again, we can discuss it more detail, but I think uh, other people can also add. Okay. So, Bajsab, if I can summarize what you have said, okay, in all these applications, whether it is food stamps or, or subsidy management, the payment is, um, is authenticated. The authentication mechanism behind the payment system is controlled by the, by the blockchain. Is that, is that a, a correct summary of this? Uh, yes, that, 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 that's correct. So uh, the authentication, uh, the beneficiaries are authenticated, as well as all the transactions are recorded uh, on the blockchain. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'll, I'll move to Dr. Naveed. Uh, Naveed, you have been working on uh, a, a couple of applications of, uh, of blockchain, especially smart grids. And, um, you know, I know uh, you supervise, you are currently supervising a senior project as well. Um, so if you can briefly talk about, uh, you know, the specific application that how the blockchain can be used in a smart grid application or the other application that your students are currently working on. Um, and what is the benefit of using the blockchain con compared to the case when you would do that without using the blockchain? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zatash. Uh, so, uh, basically, uh, the area that I uh, want to apply blockchain or uh, my students are doing uh, is smart grid. Uh, over the years, we have seen that uh, the solar panels and the um, distributed energy uh, resources, they are becoming very common. So anyone, uh, the prices of solar panels, they are rapidly decreasing. Um, anyone can buy solar panels, install them on the rooftop. But if you do the analysis, uh, we can see that a lot of energy uh, or some portion of energy that is produced by these solar panels, uh, it, if you don't install battery, it goes to waste. So around uh, this uh, presumption, uh, prosumer behavior where we have a community with a lot of uh, these solar panels installed on their rooftops, uh, we can create a peer-to-peer -peer energy trading system. 
So in peer-to-peer -peer energy trading system, we can have a micro grid where the neighbors they can share or trade their energy with the other neighbors who can buy or sell the energy and trade the energy at prices uh, which might be lower than uh, what the grid traditional grid is offering. And uh, once again, because the entities in the system, uh, they cannot trust each other and the blockchain, it can create a trustless environment where the peers they can uh, they can trade interact with each other share some resources among them and then do the financial settlements um, for example so everything is recorded and once the once the blockchain it grows to a certain uh, certain size um, it it becomes resistant to temper uh, temper tempering with the records like dr basit was also mentioning so authentication is one as aspect and uh, another uh, important property of the blockchain is uh, uh, immutability of the records that are being kept on the on the blockchain and it also facilitates auditability um, so in that sense uh, this uh, application area where we can uh, have greater inclusion um, of uh, the consumers uh, who can participate in this shared economy where they can uh, for example, trade energy with each other, and a pilot project uh, has already been launched um, in in in, uh, in New York in uh, the, the famous project of peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. That's called uh, Brooklyn Microgrid, where we have where, where they have already installed these concepts. Uh, the the challenge uh, when we bring blockchain to these applications is the um, identification of appropriate, uh, for example, consensus protocols, network management protocols, uh, data management proto protocols, because blockchain, it has its own overheads. And if we want to run uh, all the blockchain on, uh, for example, IoT nodes or resource constrained nodes, then we have to be very careful and we have to carefully select um, those uh, kind of, uh, those kind of uh, protocols uh, that can facilitate the implementation in these areas. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Naveed. Um, so I would like to go back to Muni and, uh, you know, talk about uh, a bit more about blockchain and as a platform, not just a cryptocurrency backend, but a, a, a complete platform which is used in, in Blockstack. And I would like to um, I know when you started early on, uh, you started with one name um, and then you progressed from one name to, you know, what you are today in Blockstack, which is a, a complete platform. Um, how is it different from Ethereum? Ethereum, you know, people are familiar with Ethereum, you know, from the, uh, from the previous few years. Um, how is Blockstack different from Ethereum and what is the journey from starting from one name to, to block stack? If you can, if you can answer that, that would be great. Yeah, uh, happy to. Also, I think, let me, let me comment a little bit about the general landscape, uh, especially for the viewers. Uh, first of all, I think that if you think blockchains or cryptocurrencies are complicated, they are, right? So the expectation should be that, yes, there are lots of moving parts here. Uh, there are many, many things to understand. And I think in general, a uh, high level framework should be that uh, there are blockchains, which is almost like, you know, in, like this next generation infrastructure. Then there are cryptocurrencies, which can be thought of both as a application of blockchains, but they also play a very integral role in how the blockchains work as well. And that sometimes confuses people. So we should, in the mental model, we should think about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, they're actually very essential to how the Bitcoin blockchain actually works as well, because it, it gives people the incentive to come together and, and operate these nodes and actually process these transactions and so on. And then there are um, companies that are actually building different tooling or different services around these networks. So almost, almost think of this as, um, as, as the internet, right? Just like there is some core internet infrastructure, blockchain is kind of like that and think of cryptocurrencies as if the internet had a native currency, right? If somehow we were able to have a native uh, currency of the internet, this is, this is kind of like what Bitcoin is. And yes, you know, Faisal did a good job describing the value of Bitcoin because it's finite, but you can have other types of 
uh, currencies as well. Bitcoin is a specific type of a currency that is trying to be something like uh, gold. And, and people see that as valuable. When, when I started in the industry, Bitcoin was trading at $90, right? So now it's trading at, at $27,000. And we have, I've seen at least three different ups and downs. So the cyclic nature of the market, and, 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 and we, can, we can box that. Uh, what, what's interesting to understand is once we have the internet, the kind of like the open infrastructure, the public infrastructure, people start building startups and companies uh, on top, right? And the same thing is happening in crypto as well. Fessel earlier mentioned Coinbase. Coinbase itself is like a $10 billion company now. And they, they, they're effectively uh, an on-ramp uh, to crypto. They make it really easy for people to buy or store Bitcoin or other, uh, other, other cryptocurrencies. So, it's a, it's a, that's kind of like the high level landscape. There, there's lots of moving parts, lots of things happening. And in terms of applications, I would actually say that yes, there are certain applications as, as Basil was talking about that are particularly well suited for, uh, for blockchains because you're trying to remove you know, dependence on some trusted party or, or so on. But in general, uh, I think this can be thought of just as a um, evolution of computing as well, right? Like just like, Back in the days, you know, we had mainframe computers and, and, and people would program these mainframes and then we got desktops uh, and, and, and then we got the internet, right? And, and cloud computing where uh, all the data is actually stored with, with some large company and, and you're kind of like writing these new types of pro programs that are talking over the network. And blockchains and decentralized computing is, it can be thought of as just an evolution of computing as well. So you can literally write pretty much any program uh, that you that you're thinking about in this new uh, in this new format, and that's what we are seeing with Blockstack as well. So you you mentioned one name. One name was kind of like a application built on the same uh, infrastructure. Uh, it was almost like we were trying to demonstrate the power of the network, uh, and 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 Blockstack is the uh, underlying network, right? So think of Blockstack as it takes blockchains and makes it easier for developers to build general purpose applications. And, and, um, and over there, let me, let, let me be a little bit more specific about it. Uh, so imagine that uh, right now people are watching this on Facebook, right? It is entirely possible to build a version of Facebook where there's no Facebook, the company behind it. Imagine like a more peer-to-peer -peer type of a network where, uh, or, 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 or think of uh, Zoom. So right now we're having this call over Zoom there's actually an app built on Blockstack. It's called uh, Pravika. And Pravika would do video encrypted calls without going through any company, right? So we all register our own usernames on a blockchain. We own them with the private key. We fire up the application, which is almost like a desktop app. So every, every user has their own uh, application. And we can, we can look up each other on the, on the blockchain network and have direct connections over a video call like that. Right, so that's that's technically already possible. People are building these applications, uh, so these would be I would classify them as almost like a transition from cloud computing to decentralized computing. And the only key difference is that you're taking one central trusted company out of the picture. But it really changes the business model. Like you know, if there's no Facebook in the middle, Facebook cannot track you. They cannot show you ads, and uh, other types of business models kind of open up for for these applications. But I, I want to um, spot, like, kind of like shine the spotlight on one new class of applications that were that almost like they weren't possible before. And these are these smart contracts, right? So what what these smart contracts are are these um, almost like new types of computer programs that can run uh, by themselves on 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 a blockchain, so they can execute in a completely trustless manner, and they can actually own assets as well. So so. Uh, People can actually, you know, have a smart contract. Uh, let's say that is a um, lending application, right? So a smart contract that actually owns Bitcoin, and people are lending USD from that smart contract. So imagine a computer program that is now holding literally hundreds of millions of dollars, and that was something that was simply not possible before, uh, where people are programming these. Um, they're essentially like automating a lot of different types of financial services, or they're automating a lot of uh, uh, functionality that, that you would typically depend on some sort of a single party or a single company for. And these smart contracts are actually 
uh, they, you need to learn new types of programming languages uh, to, to code them. And it's a very, very exciting early stage area. And for people who are listening, I would, I would say that uh, you can broadly divide the blockchain applications into uh, decentralized applications uh, or smart contracts. And smart contracts are what I would say, uh, as, as of today, like this year, they're actually finding more kind of like rapid use cases and they're growing extremely quickly. So if you're a developer, like that, that might be an area uh, to, to look into. So Muneeb, if you explain it in layman terms, mein, ke smart contract is tarah ka hota hai. maybe a real world example of a smart contract, you know, between two entities or multiple entities, that would be really useful. Right. I think up uh, smart contract me up here they can let's say um, let's say up me uh, prediction market banana right like or, or simple say up example they up example they lay like a cricket a match a way okay and up me quick bet like I yeah okay other Pakistan match GTA to you to you India GTA to you right usually it's not the application kill you you would need some trusted party you would say okay uh, you know, this company is running a program and I trust that this company will do the right thing. If let's say for some reason you cannot trust any single party, uh, smart contracts may you don't need to trust anyone because code will call transparent of that. It runs on a blockchain, whatever you program, like that is the thing that is going to happen. And then you can have uh, data feeds. So people call them oracles. So an oracle can actually uh, be a data feed that says that, you know, if the result of the match is X, execute this piece of code, right? And that, that, that piece of code can do anything. And, and then this is, that's just an example. Uh, other types of uh, smart contracts could be, you know, if you are, let's say, uh, trying to build a, uh, a decentralized exchange, right? So these are smart contracts that actually exist on top of Blockstack. Imagine that uh, it's a cryptocurrency exchange completely implemented as a smart contract on a blockchain. If you're a trader, you're not interacting with any company, right? You know that here is the smart contract against which I'm trying to trade. Uh, here's my transaction. I am uh, trying to uh, exchange Bitcoin with dollars. And you can actually interact with a smart contract in a transparent way to get your transaction done and actually exchange Bitcoins with, with USD and, and, and so on. And in some ways, like it's actually, imagine, in cryptocurrencies, there's uh, like, you, you know, these are at early stages. Sometimes you don't trust an exchange that just came online or sometimes these exchanges shut down and they they uh, they run away with your money. But a smart contract can't do that because you can inspect the code. You know what the contract can and cannot do. And you're, you're not dealing with a human. You're not dealing with a company. So you know that if I'm sending, you know, a Bitcoin here and I'm getting some other cryptocurrency back, that will, will absolutely happen because it's backed by mathematics and, and computer code. So Muneeb, um, so uh, from your explanation, what I understood is that this tra, you know, if there are two parties and they want to exchange, um, you know, do some barter or something like that, um, in exchange of money, they want to get some service. So, koi uh, escrow ek darmyan mein aata hai, which ensures ke, you know, between these two parties, they both of them have to trust the escrow. So can we can we consider the smart contract to be an equivalent of a virtual escrow or something like that? I think I think escrows are a subset. So it's very easy to implement escrows uh, with smart contracts. Let me give a completely different example, right? Imagine so these are smart contracts built on our system where um, we have effectively created a new type of a, a domain name system, right? So imagine mm -hmm. you know you, you have Facebook.com or Google.com. In the back end, these domains, uh, it's almost like a federated service on, on the internet called, called it the domain name system. And your names are getting registered with that, uh, with those servers. You can implement this entire service as a smart contract on a blockchain, where all the smart contract is doing is that, you know, Zartash came before me and registered Zartash dot whatever, right? And, and because you came before me, you are the owner now. Right. And the smart contract decides that you are the owner because you were the first person to, to register it or when the names expire. So you're almost like automating this functionality 
in a completely transparent way uh, on a on a on a blockchain system, and it's a it's a uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a very general purpose thing. You can almost build any type of any type of smart contract, and obviously there are constraints given you know the the transaction bandwidth of, of uh, blockchains and so on. Okay, so um, one last question, Mani, from you before I move on to uh, to Faisal's up is. Uh, कि मुझे ये बताएं कि ब्लॉक स्टैक यूजेस सम एग्जिस्टिंग ब्लॉकचेन या कोई प्राइवेट ब्लॉकचेन है उसकी और ये प्राइवेट ब्लॉकचेन कितनी आसान होती है क्रिएट करना या सो आई वुड से प्राइवेट ब्लॉकचेन्स आर पर्सनली आई एम लेस इंटरेस्टेड इन प्राइवेट ब्लॉकचेन्स बिकॉज़ दे स्टार्ट लुकिंग मोर लाइक डेटाबेसेस राइट सो इफ यू आर इफ यू आर रनिंग अ प्राइवेट ब्लॉकचेन विद इन अ सिंगल कंपनी और और इवन लाइक टू थ्री कंपनीज you could almost have a federation of databases there as well and there's there's like you know uh, you, and still get a, a lot of the benefits but what we do like uh, if some of you might be familiar with ethereum so what what ethereum did was it created a separate network uh, to introduce smart contracts uh, in a in a blockchain so bitcoin the bitcoin blockchain it doesn't have smart contract functionality and for good reason right bitcoin just focuses on one application that is the bitcoin cryptocurrency Uh, so so vitalik created ethereum uh, that is has a more general purpose smart contract language on it it's a it's a javascript like language called called solidity uh, what we are doing is we are effectively enabling these smart contracts and applications in the bitcoin ecosystem right so we have actually almost like designed a separate blockchain that connects to bitcoin to enable this functionality uh because we think that there are network effects with bitcoin right so just like in the early days of the internet there were many different networks and then everything kind of like emerged on top of tcpip and the internet right everything collapsed on <coughs> one big big network and we think the bitcoin is going to be that network whereas ethereum is almost like a disconnected separate blockchain and obviously uh, to, to to give people an idea of like you know how much opportunity there is in in this space uh imagine that you know when i started working in this area of 2013 uh bitcoin was trading at $90 right and the entire market cap of cryptocurrencies was in in like single digit billions or something and now the market cap is around 500 billion uh it's not just bitcoin like there are uh, our project so we have raised around 75 million dollars um in funding and i think maybe two months ago i was talking to fasel and i told him that our market cap is 150 million dollars the so is a publicly tradable asset uh just yesterday we crossed 400 million dollars in market cap right so these these things are rapidly growing and and uh same with funding if you're if you're a startup and you're looking to actually work in the area uh there's a lot of venture capital available to not just like build these crypto networks but actually to build applications to build smart contracts to build uh, different uses of of these these networks out there's one of the fastest growing uh, uh, sectors in tech right now and i wouldn't be surprised if it actually starts consuming a lot of the uh, traditional internet uh, uh, services great thank you thank you manip so we have a, a few questions from the from the facebook live feed i i believe that ali has posted i think um, you know i would like to ask those questions from the from the panelists and uh, it seems that some questions are are probably relevant to fazal so i'll ask those first uh, so fazan is asking why does bitcoin still lack intrinsic value and is widely not acceptable as a means of payment um so wide use of of bitcoin as a means of payment so uh, why why is has why that has not happened yet sure um one the first one is obviously adoption as i mentioned it's less than 1% of the planet right so really if i carry my bitcoin around and try to pay someone else for them it's not really going to work right but uh, paypal accepting it um and then essentially other merchants starting to this uh, accept it eventually that will happen but the most important thing is the question is do i really want to spend my bitcoin because there's a difference between hard money and soft money so hard money is by definition worth more tomorrow as we've seen in the case of bitcoin where munib was saying he entered the market at $90 now it's $26000 right so it's closer to buying a store of value like a plot or like a piece of land um so generally people don't want to spend bitcoin so there there are other currencies that are emerging 
such as central bank digital currencies, and they may be actually the uh, uh, precipice of what will result in people spending cryptocurrencies, uh, but again, in a regulated fashion. And I keep, the, you know, I'll, the only analogy I'll do to understand Bitcoin in a way is that you have to look at regulation, things like FATF, which are pushing for cashless systems. You have to look at things like OECD common reporting standards that are essentially ensuring that your data is sent to your tax residency in terms of your bank account data and assets abroad. Uh, and this is worldwide, right? The US has FATCA and uh, other iterations of it. So we're, as we move, you have to visualize a world that's truly cashless and think about five, 10 years out from now. And then you'll understand that Bitcoin has a value as a settlement collateral asset, right? So, uh, which is decentralized. So if, let's say China and the US decide that they don't want to you know, trade, respect each other's currencies, then they may end up settling in gold or Bitcoin, assuming that it does become that use case. So it's just in its initial stages. And this would be like betting on the internet in the 19, early 90s. And uh, that's why you hear a lot of criticism. So some of the early people that moved in started understanding those changes uh, in terms of the, of the protocol there. Okay. Um, so I, we have a couple of questions uh, that I would like to ask uh, Dr. Basit and, uh, and Dr. Naveed. Um, so one question is very relevant to, to Dr. Bassett's area of expertise is what are the benefits of blockchain compared to the distributed databases? So it's a very basic, uh, you know, sort of fundamental question. Okay, distributed data, databases or blockchain have. Um, so what is the real benefit there? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm uh, happy that uh, someone asked this question. Uh, so distributed databases, um, again, one one the use case of distributed databases is, or, or, or databases in particular is, when your records um, cannot, uh, can be altered. Uh, in in um, databases, we use the term online transaction processing, OLTP, as opposed to OALP, online uh, analysis. Uh, so in OLTP uh, databases, your records can be removed, they can be altered, they can be updated. In blockchain, uh, nothing can be altered, nothing can be changed. You have records that can only be uh, appended. Uh, so, so that's one thing. Uh, also, blockchain cannot be used to um, answer queries. Again, simple uh, kind of a lookup, uh, the value of certain asset, who is the owner? We can do that very easily, but we cannot run any complex queries that require uh, getting information from different sources. And again, um, trying to filter some information based on, on, on your query. So, so in that particular aspect, this is not uh, distributed databases. Blockchain is distributed ledger, as we said earlier. A ledger is um, a sequence of records. So whatever, a transaction has taken place uh, that will be uh, available in an immutable manner um, on the uh, blockchain. So in that sense, this is similar to uh, distributed databases or any databases. Now, having said that, um, another use case of blockchain, which is uh, on which we, we also uh, build different applications is blockchain can encode your application logic or your business process. Um, when we talk about databases, you have definitely transactions um, and you can use these transactions to implement your business logic. So you can, again, on distributed databases, define uh, the application logic over there, but intrinsically through the use of smart contracts, you can very easily encode your application logic or your business process on a blockchain network. And that would provide you with um, additional capabilities of transparency, uh, auditability, um, as well as recoverability. A and the database community is also looking at this aspect of uh, blockchain. Great. Um, so we have another question from the audience, um, you know, that is relevant to Pakistan and the use of blockchain in, in Pakistan, any area or sector in Pakistan where the application of black blockchain is being considered or being applied currently. And if it is not being used, um, 
what techniques what you know what do they use uh, as a, as an alternate so maybe maybe dr navid if you want to answer that or dr basit either 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 one of you um you know whoever wants to go first yeah i i i can uh, just give a quick answer i was uh, at a security and exchange commission of pakistan in october uh, we, i had a presentation over there and there i learned that uh, security and exchange commission of pakistan is considering and also in in terms of approving a, a blockchain based application which is on uh, these agricultural loans or agricultural based insurance so they have received these uh, proposals um, and uh, they have evaluated them and they were very close to approving them so again uh, our security and exchange commission is is closely monitoring those and is aware of all these and uh, trying to uh, uh, think of all these different applications uh, in in that sector okay great uh, so dr navid aap se sawal hai ki you know you work with the students and in this particular area um, so maybe you can gauge how difficult easy it is to um, to 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 get students um, who are skilled in in this particular area um, so sawal kisi ne pucha hai ye ki um ke can you share your thoughts on crypto competencies in education and how you you could implement this in pakistan um so crypto comp- competencies in education yeah so uh, first uh, we maybe we need to understand ke blockchain um, can have many generic applications many generic use cases and um, as the panel uh, uh, has uh, कमेंटेड एंड डिस्कशन में ये चीजें सामने आई हैं बार बार दैट ब्लॉक चेन इज अ कॉम्प्लिकेटेड काइंड ऑफ अ थिंग इट्स अ कॉम्प्लेक्स थिंग बिकॉज यू नीड कॉम्पिडेंस इन हाउ यू मैनेज द नेटवर्क हाउ यू मैनेज द डेटा हाउ यू मैनेज द कंसेंस हाउ यू राइट यूर स्मार्ट कॉन्ट्रेक्ट बिकॉज इफ द स्मार्ट कॉन्ट्रेक्ट इज नॉट वेल रिटर्न इट इट कुड लीड टू मे बी हैकिंग और देर कैन बी सिक्योरिटी रिस्क so uh, there are a lot of things that can be included regarding blockchain uh, into for example the the education and uh, the capacity of students can be built so that they 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 can build these applications blockchain based applications uh, uh, and uh, uh, make some something useful out of it currently i feel that uh, finding people who know this stuff and who have really worked on blockchain platform for example who have worked on ethereum or uh, the for, uh, the other forks of ethereum for example quorum or uh, hyperledger finding people is uh, in in pakistan with the relevant competence is really really difficult um okay so um, just uh, my experience i am just starting in this area so so i uh, you know that that means that perhaps there is a need to um to to maybe tweak the curriculum uh, locally at the universities at least in, you know from pakistani standpoint in local universities i'm not sure if uh, universities outside pakistan they have um you know full fledged programs or or uh, you know uh, specialization areas Uh, in the in the cryptocurrency and and blockchain areas um, money do are you aware of any of those uh, those no, programs i would i would actually say that it's it's very early days in crypto and there's like a massive opportunity here like like for example uh smart contracts they're they they we can we can start uh, courses on uh, teaching students how to write smart contracts but if you do that you would be one of the first universities in the world to do it right like for example we are trying to do the same thing uh, i finished my phd at, at at princeton and i'm been trying to convince them to basically start courses and we are getting close but they're not they're not there yet right and and they they might get there in a year or so but right now especially in pakistan i would say that there's a huge opportunity of training the next generation of entrepreneurs and engineers who know how to write smart contracts who know the basics of of the blockchain and so on and again this will be like you know if you can roll back the clock go to 1995 and try to make uh, pakistan a hub for internet startups 
right? And right now we have that opportunity, but I think the, the interesting thing here is that because of the nature of cryptocurrencies and especially of Bitcoin and capital flows, uh, the general reaction from the Pakistani government is the, the first kind of like step is like, you know, let's just stop all of this and, and not, not do that, which I think uh, this might be a little bit controversial, but I think we need to embrace this like as quickly as possible in the sense of um, think of cryptocurrency exchanges as almost like ISPs. Like you cannot cut yourself out of the rest of the, the, the internet. Like if you, like if, if back in the nineties, you, the government said that you cannot have ISPs in the country, right? The entire country will not get access to the internet. Similarly, if you're saying that you cannot have cryptocurrency exchanges effectively by, by banning Bitcoin, you're saying you can't have exchanges over here. Uh, you're cutting yourself off from the crypto economy. And so I think one of the, whenever we talk to uh, anyone in the government, uh, any of the regulators, we're trying to do some work in Pakistan as well. We have a local chapter of our project uh, in the country. Like we would, we, I would argue for convincing the government that you should actually have a regulated exchange, like uh, an exchange that complies with all of the regulations of the country, but allows people access uh, to these cryptocurrencies. So I do think that there is a, um, there's a, there's a large opportunity here, even from a financial perspective. I, I think even taking uh, ideas that you know might sound crazy, like taking some of uh, Pakistan's budget, like very small portion, 1%, 2%, and, and, and converting, that, converting that into Bitcoin uh, is, is actually might not be a bad bet at all. Uh, given, given that how much, if you become very uh, friendly to crypto, uh, there is actually, uh, a lot of lot to gain here because not a lot of countries or governments are being friendly to crypto. And, and given how large of a population Pakistan is, if Pakistan actually just starts taking that stance, it's a little bit like how San Francisco is not very friendly to uh, tech companies like the city and people are now leaving uh, for Austin or, or, or Florida or something like that. And those, those cities are trying to be more friendly to entrepreneurs and, and that's working. Like similarly, I think there's a there there is a stance to take that if if Pakistan somehow becomes extremely friendly to crypto, I, I know that uh, KP recently uh, that they had a resolution and they basically passed uh, cryptocurrency mining and stuff, and that actually made international news uh, through throughout the, the crypto world. But I think there's there's room for much more here. <clears throat> so thank you, Munib. Um, we have one more question. I think um, you know from you. Um, we, I had written down a, a, a couple of questions and then the uh, audience has asked a few questions in the same um, in, in the same line. I would like to club those questions in, in one about the mining process um, that we understand that in the mining process, you generate this, these, these bitcoins, you know, limited number of, of bitcoins per day, and then the value keeps on, on increasing. And there is a, there is a power consumption, you know, um, you know, involved in in generating those bitcoins, and and somebody in the audience has also asked a similar uh, kind of a question that uh, what's your view on the proof of work versus proof of stake? Um, and and they say that the concern is that if the bitcoin becomes the future, you know, uh, likely so, uh, the computational power to to process all those transactions would be would be immense if we use the proof of work. Um, what are your your thoughts on on that? Yeah, so I think we are uh, we are generally in the camp that proof of work is by far the most secure way of doing things. So we don't know if people would invent something better down the road, but at least in, in proof of stake. And so so our blockchain doesn't use proof of stake. We looked at proof of stake algorithms, uh, but we invented something different. It's called proof of transfer. Uh, it's almost like you der derive the security of your blockchain from Bitcoin's proof of work but are able to have proof of stake like um, uh, benefits uh, as well. So it's, it's almost like think of that as a hybrid. It's the best of both worlds between proof of stake and, and proof of work. But we are in the camp that proof of work is almost like a necessary evil. And the, uh, the electricity that is being consumed, it's almost like it's going into a global settlement layer, right? So imagine even sure. data, like even when you know Facebook is uh, storing uh, cat pictures that you're taking, right? Like they're consuming electricity on data centers, right? So, so the uh, the power consumption of Bitcoin, especially given how valuable Bitcoin might become, might actually be something that is completely 
justified. But another interesting thing here, I'll make one comment about proof of stake that um, in proof of stake, there is a bootstrapping of trust issue, right? Like in the sense that um, you need certain trusted information to even um, kind of like start processing things, right? And if you, uh, and, and, and whereas proof of work is uh, more sovereign in the sense that you can just look at the blockchain and anyone can independently verify that which is which version of the blockchain is the right version of the blockchain. And then there are uh, all sorts of like um, technical details and complexities. I, I, I'm happy to go into them, but it, like at the high level, like I'm more in the proof of work camp that it, it, it tends to be the more secure way of doing things. Or at least the world needs one secure proof of work blockchain. And then you can kind of like anchor to it and, and build other types of applications and, 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 and blockchains on top. So, so Mani, uh, in the mining process, if you if you need the proof of work or you know somehow to generate the the new blocks, uh, you need to consume some power to to generate those blocks. Um, in, in in that case, you know, isn't there a the, doesn't there exist some way of not consuming the power and still be able to generate the sure, sure. The, you you can off. let yeah. me let me let me walk you through that a little bit right. So imagine that. Uh, think of the power consumption as almost like a, um, it's a, it, it, it works as a rate limiting factor for producing different versions of the blockchain, right? So imagine that I want to rewrite the history of Bitcoin. To rewrite the history of Bitcoin, I will actually have to consume so much power and calculate all these hashes in the right order as well, right? So after writing block number 1000, you know, uh, if I want to make a, if I want to go back in history and rewrite a block like, you know, 100 days ago, it's almost like mathematically impossible. But if you take away the proof of work part and let's say you replace it by something else, anything else, like in proof of stake, people are actually putting up their uh, money at stake that, you know, here's a, here's a pile of money. If I misbehave, you can try to uh, penalize me, right? But the, the, the group of people who control the majority of the network can actually come up with almost like infinite number of histories of the blockchain because they're just signing messages, right? They're not, I can, I can, I can sign a million different messages for a million different histories of the blockchain and you wouldn't be able to know which one is, is correct or not because all of them are signed by me, right? So let, let's, say, let's say if three or four parties, if their signatures is all that is needed to verify that this was the right history, there's no uh, uh, kind of like rate limitation or work component going in. So that work component, because that work component is also a factor of time as well. It, it, at some point, there isn't enough compute power on the planet uh, or, or there isn't enough time for, some, for someone to actually go back seven years and try to rewrite you know, some part of Bitcoin. So you, the amount of security benefits that you're getting by doing that proof of work, especially over time, over a very long period of time, uh, actually makes it almost impossible for the history of Bitcoin to be changed, and which is which is extremely important for property. Okay, so uh, I have a couple of questions uh, related to the government's, um, you know, uh, allowing or, or disallowing uh, use of Bitcoin, and I would like Faisal uh, Sahab, if you give this answer. कि दो क्वेश्चंस हैं मैं उनको भी क्लब ही कर देता हूं एक तो जेनेरिक क्वेश्चन है कि व्हिच गवर्नमेंट्स अराउंड द वर्ल्ड हैव अप्रूव्ड बिटकॉइन एज एज लीगल मीडियम और क्या इसकी वजह से कोई मनी लॉन्ड्रिंग का कोई प्रमोट हो जाएगी और दूसरा क्वेश्चन इज रेलेवेंट टू पाकिस्तान के पाकिस्तान में यू नो पीपल आर पाकिस्तान इज अ कैश इकॉनमी एंड पीपल डोंट इवन कीप द कैश इन द बैंक दे कीप द द कैश इन देयर इन देयर हाउसेस यू नो घरों में घरों में लोगों ने रखे होते हैं undocumented economy so um, bitcoin ki penetration in a country like pakistan how is that going to to happen so ek taraf to government approvals hai um aur dusri side ke upar jo hai wo uh, acceptability in the in the society eh, wo kis tarah se kis tarah sure. se hogi so i'll i'll first talk about the governments um, so mm-hmm. let's look at the existing system right most of world trade happens through the swift system within banks mm-hmm. right and there's four currencies primarily on that the us dollar the euro the pound and the japanese yen right so you can call them the reserve currencies of the world where 
uh, countries like Pakistan have their reserves in dollars or euros, depending on their trade. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, all four of those countries that essentially effectively control world trade have legalized uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, and they have exchanges and they're allowing their citizens to move in and purchase them. So what's happening is now there's a, there's a whole uh, dichotomy happening here. As we're nearing the end of this monetary cycle, the reserve currencies by de facto suck in the energy of non-reserve currencies. Hence, the rupee has devalued significantly since 2017 versus the dollar. The same things happen in India, Iran, around the world, right? And, and the reason why I explain this is Bitcoin is, uh, or cryptocurrencies or adoption or anything is based on necessity breeds adoption, right? And so as people are feeling devaluation, they're naturally, they wake up and they realize that they can't take their monetary system for granted. Most of us in Pakistan understand this because we've been experiencing devaluation throughout our lifetimes, regardless of what age we are. The rest of the world actually is experiencing it after potentially a 30 year cycle. I would say almost a 50 year cycle. Last time this happened in the US was from 1971 to 1982 where it's effectively their interest rates are actually one time 16% in the US, right? which we experienced last year. So that phenomena as more and more people wake up and as inflation gets closer and closer. So I'll give you a definition of hyperinflation. In school, we always thought about hyperinflation being a wheelbarrow in Argentina to go get bread. The reality is hyperinflation is not symmetric. So right now it exists in real estate worldwide. So the number, number one definition is if your annual income a plot or real estate is three x, um, uh, three times more than your annual income. It probably is not affordable, right? It's over. It's in a bubble. So people are putting. It's getting concentrated in a few hands. People that have money are parking it in real estate, since banks essentially you can't. There's a source of funds question there, right? Number two is the stock market worldwide is in hyperinflation, and uh, the third one is the bond market, which is bigger, which actually is the underlying currency market, right? Both corporate and sovereign bonds. So all this is playing out as we speak. And so the adoption of Bitcoin is, it's one of those things is, I don't think it's going to wait technology, just like I'll, I'll give the analogy that the State Bank of Pakistan does not want to be Pemra to Netflix or YouTube or, uh, you know, the PTA to WhatsApp and Skype, right? And I, I've highlighted this before, I mean, even at public uh, government forums that the more proactive approach is one, either to stabilize our currency, which effectively we cannot given that we're not a reserve currency. So then the next logical approach is to allow some sort of an exchange uh, in a legitimate manner. And to allay the concerns that Bitcoin is somehow um, allows laundering, the, the number one currency used for money laundering is the US dollar, right? So I don't think that disqualifies it as a currency, um, but actually it's the most traceable form of money. Um, every transaction, when you pull money out of an ATM, even in Pakistan or in the US, after that, the next time the banks track the velocity of money, that serial number on the currency, when it enters the banking system again. In Bitcoin, every time exchange is hands, there's a record, permanent record, it goes in. Governments already have the tool, it's called chain analysis. They can actually go in down to your IP and tra track down each and every single transaction. That's why in Bitcoin, they're working on private transactions. But those private transactions, Mimble, Wimble, and multiple other technologies. But again, those are going to be always bound by and I keep saying this as the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, they're going to govern digital currencies. And a lot of what's playing out regulation wise is actually to allow central bank digital currencies and then the back end settlement of uh, the, uh, your cryptocurrencies. I would not separate blockchain from cryptocurrencies. I think that's one of the major flaws in looking at the two because as Muneeb had mentioned, for example, JP Morgan Chase, which is one of the largest uh, investment banks in the world, has created a private chain of Ethereum called Quorum. And they're using it now to settle the largest market in the world, which is called the repo market, which is bonds and collateral. Um, but again, it just turns into a glorified database. The whole concept here is that when you store information in a centralized location, and then you build a firewall around it and it gets hacked, as we've seen that happen to Google and everybody just about two, a couple of days ago, the decentralized system and the consensus um, uh, algorithm it's a consensus uh, mechanism makes data more secure. So <clears throat> the easy way, I'll just wrap it up in this, is that the way to look at it is right now, data as a server can then firewall or guards 
the data itself in this consensus mechanism in a way gets encrypted and can be dispersed on millions of devices. And then basically you need to have a, a, a majority control on the number of processing uh, units that are, that are actually solving the mathematical algorithm, right? And to, in order to gain control, which costs like billions of dollars now, especially for something like Bitcoin, which is like four or 500 billion. So in my opinion, it's very safe. I think uh, obviously, uh, you know, you have to follow your local regulations. I'm not advising on anyone to go into Bitcoin. For Pakistan, lastly, all I will say is that I do think our government is going to come around um, and implement uh, legalized exchanges because that is the most stable mechanism uh, with KYC, AML, and CFT laws. Thank you. I think there was a news that KPK has uh, announced some, you know, move forward in this direction. And, uh, you know, hopefully sanity will prevail and... Uh, you know, we'll see some some good news coming out of there, and the rest of the provinces of Pakistan as well. Uh, so um, I think we have lots of areas. I have a bullet points. I have a lot of areas to cover in the UAB. But uh, unfortunately, I have to do a lot of shared session. Karna um, um, well, fortunately, a core session. Karna unfortunately, we could not cover all of that today. Uh, just in there, you know, new internet architectures, privacy regulations, edge computing, uh, yeah, cryptocurrency or securities, ke dermian, how do, what's the balance between the two? Um, you know, inko, isko jo hai, hum asset treat karein, ya, ya isko jo hai, you know, daily use ki currency ke torpe hum treat karein. We have sare questions hum address nahi kar paayin. Uh, but one thing is, which is clear from the discussion is that ke there is definitely a big, um, you know, open area, huge opportunity. And um, as Muneeb had mentioned that uh, this is uh, this is an area which is in its infancy. Uh, it is only going to to get bigger and we will need more and more people to, um, to, to contribute to this area. And, uh, you know, Dr. Navi, Dr. Basit will endorse that it is, it is almost, you know, you have to train people from scratch uh, to work in this this area. You know, um, so I think uh, universities will slowly will uh, will 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 go into this direction. Munib uh, Princeton you know they are they are not there yet, but they will hopefully get there uh, sooner. Uh, Pakistan may you have new courses introduced karana curriculum ke changes lana is relatively easier. So hopefully Pakistan may be um, hopefully sooner uh, than later they will they will get implemented at the at the universities and we will have people coming out of universities who will be trained to to work in the in in the in the in the blockchain area um so um Muneeb, if you have any any final words on on how um how this technology is going to transform the next generation of internet we, we do know that privacy can there there are challenges ke, uh, GDPR requires ke anyone should be able to go and, and change the, the records. Uh, apne records ja ke delete kar sakta ho. But blockchain probably if you use that, that technology blindly, it, it will not allow you to um, wo mutable nahi us tari, us tara se, jis tara se requirement privacy, GDPR ki type ki privacy. Hogi. So there will be challenges unko kis tara cover karna hoga. So how do you see this... Uh, um, this technology impacting the the next generation of uh, computing as well as as well as the internet. Yeah, so I think my my view is is uh, extremely bullish here. I actually think like this this might um, take a while for people to kind of like fully understand, but I actually think that crypto is going to become the internet. Right? It's, it's a little bit of a mic, almost like a migration happening, but there's the traditional internet uh, because most of the services that, as we know it, like imagine, you know, what is the internet? Like we go on CNN.com and then we see a web page or we go on Facebook.com and we, we are messaging people. Uh, some of this core internet infrastructure is actually now being implemented on top of crypto networks, right? So instead of going to CNN.com, those domain names would be powered by crypto networks uh, there are new types of browsers, new types of applications, and you're slowly, it's a, it's a slow migration happening from the traditional internet to a much more secure, much more um, kind of like stable uh, next generation internet. It's almost like for the first time ever, you're seeing the core internet 
uh, protocols being replaced after like the first 30, 40 years. And, and there's a massive opportunity because this is not only disrupting the, the financial industry, not just like Wall Street and the banks and, and those institutions, it's also disrupting Silicon Valley. Like Facebook, uh, they, have, they have a large group now. They're trying to actually basically do something in, in blockchains and, and, and they're starting projects and whatnot. And, but a lot of other large tech companies are also, uh, they can get disrupted by, uh, by, by this revolution. And uh, you made a comment about, uh, you know, developers being, uh, uh, getting trained in, in Pakistan or, or some of these regions. Let me share this stat that look at the potential of this, uh, this industry, uh, like we've seen it grow from like, you know, a couple of billion to 500 billion. Now. It might be a trillion dollar market next year. Right. And at that point, like it's, 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 uh, it's right up there with, with, with other large sectors. Can you imagine that there are 8,000 developers total in the industry right now, 8,000. And for some of these networks, like Ethereum is valued at $70 billion. It has 2,000 developers, 2,000 active developers in the entire ecosystem. And the opportunity here is enormous. Like imagine that you could train like, you know, 100,000, 200,000 developers who know how to write smart contracts, who know how to build these things. And the ratio of what a developer can do and how much value they can generate on these crypto networks is completely out of whack, completely out of whack from traditional internet, completely out of whack from, you know, any, anything else you can do. So if there's like one takeaway, I would say that if, if you are in the government, if you're in the, in the regulation business, you can actually literally change the lives of like millions of people by having the right policies in place. And, and, and we are willing to help. We are actually the first cryptocurrency that got qualified by the SEC in the US. So we were able to kind of like convince the regulators here in the US for what, what um, legal and accounting frameworks can work uh, for them, and they actually gave us the the qualification for a, for an offering. Uh, like we can do the same thing with governments as well. And the second area would be uh, universities and courses. Like I think if we can just like direct a lot of that raw engineering talent to smart contracts and crypto networks, like that is one of the best things that can uh, that can happen to the country right now. Great. Thank you very much, um, Munib, and thank you everyone else. Uh, Basit Saab, Naveed Saab, you have time nikala. Faisal, I know you are traveling, or traveling mein time nikalna bada aur zyada mushkil ho jata hai. Uh, bahut shukriya aapka. Thank you very much, Munib, for uh, enlightening us, and uh, I hope you bought some of those bitcoins when it was ninety dollars. <laughs> I, I, I did, I did, and I'm not selling. <laughs> I'm actually, I, 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 I'm still buying. I've been, I've been buying throughout. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, thank you for your time or, uh, you know, looking forward to, uh, to have another session sometime soon. Thanks. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Ji. Thank you everyone. Thank you.